So welcome everyone. My name is Molly DePippo. I'm the manager of school and teacher programs here at the Museum of Jewish Heritage, a living memorial to the Holocaust. I'm pleased to welcome all of you to this year's Chancellor's Day program, Hiding and Rescue During the Holocaust. We are honored to have as our first speaker today, Dr. Sylvia Terabini Frakopan. Dr. Frakopan holds a doctoral degree in history from Technical University Berlin and a MA in Comparative Literature from the University of Copenhagen. She worked at the Danish Center for Holocaust and Genocide Studies in Copenhagen from 2001 to 2005. Recently, Dr. Frakopan has published the book, The Jews of Denmark and the Holocaust, Life and Death in the Theresienstadt Ghetto. Based on Danish survivors' testimonies, it focuses on everyday life in the Theresienstadt Ghetto. Our plan for this program is as follows. Dr. Frakopan will speak for approximately 40 to 45 minutes, after which time we'll invite questions from participants. Please feel free to use the chat function to submit questions, which will be read after the lecture. As a reminder, after this lecture with Dr. Frakopan, we will host three other sessions with speakers. Uh, the registration links are in the chat for those of you who haven't registered yet for the other programs, but would like to join us. And you must register in order to join. Tomorrow, I will send you a link to an online evaluation and CTLE sign-up form. So please plan to spend a few minutes completing that. It's important to us and to our funders. I would like to take a moment to thank the Conference on Jewish Material Claims Against Germany for funding today's program. Additionally, educational programming at the museum is made possible in part by the Myron and Elaine Meilman Family Foundation in memory of Elaine Meilman and public funds from the New York City Department of Cultural Affairs in partnership with the City Council and City Council members Margaret Chin, Heim Deutsch, and Ben Kalos. Without further ado, I'd like to hand it over to our speaker, Dr. Sylvia Terabini Frakopan. Hi. Um, thank you, Molly. Uh, on April 9, 1940, German troops crossed the Danish border. At this time, around 6,500 Jews were living in Denmark out of a population of about 3.8 million people. The Jewish population had various backgrounds and can be divided into three primary groups, old Danish Jewish families whose ancestors had come to Denmark during the 17th century, and of whom a majority belonged to the upper middle class or upper class. Sometimes this group is jokingly referred to as the Viking Jews. They made up about a quarter of the Jews in the country. The largest group, about half of the Jews, originated from Eastern Europe and had fled pogroms in the Russian Empire before and around World War I. A large part belonged to the working class and an important number of them were tailors and shoemakers. Finally, the last quarter of Jews was made up of refugees from Germany and its occupied countries, people who had fled to Denmark after Hitler's ascension to power. Within this group, about a third were teenagers or young people who had arrived with the Zionist organizations Hechalutz and Juthalia. The purpose was to learn agriculture and after about a year to travel on to Palestine. But because of the outbreak of the World War, about 500 had been stuck in Denmark and in 1943, most of them were based on farms on Zeeland and Funen, mostly far from Copenhagen. So, that's yeah on the peninsula. Um, uh, there were some on the Middle Island and then on the southern south, south of Copenhagen. Um, when the German troops crossed the border, the government and King Christian X issued a, con a proclamation calling on the population to refrain from all resistance. The Danish government and parliament entered into a so-called policy of cooperation, uh, something which continued until the government resigned on August 29, 1943. By cooperating with the Germans, the Danish government remained in power and Denmark was treated as if it was neutral. At no time were Denmark and Germany formally at war with each other. No Nazi regime was installed and Danish judicial authorities continued to function with arrests being made by Danish police and crimes being tried by Danish judges. Until late August 43, 
That means as long as the Danish government was in power, neither death sentences nor deportations took place. Um, after Hitler's ascension to power, uh, an increasing number of Jewish refugees tried to come to Denmark. As in other countries, Jews were not considered political refugees and it was therefore almost impossible to obtain entry and residence permits. Some did succeed and found a safe haven for a time, but for many it was a constant battle with the authorities to be allowed to stay. Jewish refugees were often strongly encouraged to move on to another country or even to return to Germany. 21 Jewish refugees, including three minor children, were even expelled directly to Germany between 1940 and 1943. This took place on Danish initiative, and the vast majority of those expelled were subsequently murdered in concentration or extermination camp. Denmark joined the anti comintern Pact in November 41, and this led to large protest demonstrations in Copenhagen. And during 42, resistance became more visible all over the country in the form of sabotage actions, which increased in the summer of 1943. Thus in August, that year large strikes took, took place in several cities driven by a more general wish to defy the occupying power. On August 28, the German authorities therefore demanded that the Danish government introduce a state of emergency curfews and death sentences to combat uh, the increasing sabotage. The Danish government refused and resigned. And from August 29, the Germans imposed martial law, which lasted until October 6. In practical terms, the government's resignation did not mean much. Cooperation with the occupying power continued through the permanent ministerial secretaries. Symbolically, however, the government's resignation was important, something the resistance in particular saw as a victory over the policy of cooperation. On August 29, around 150 so-called prominent Danes were arrested and interned as hostages by the Germans. Among them were also about 20 men with Jewish origins, including Chief Rabbi Max Friediger. They were not arrested because they were Jews, but because of their status uh, in society. But for nine of them, it became fatal that they had been taken hostage because they were later deported to Ghetto Theresienstadt or Theresien, uh, as it is often called in English. Um, men who were either married to non-Jews or who had a non-Jewish parent were set free uh, after some weeks. Um, while uh, this was going on. On September 8, 43, Werner Best, who was the Reich plenipotentiary in Denmark, sent a telegram to Berlin recommending that an action against the Jews in Denmark should take place during the state of emergency that had been imposed on August 29. And 10 days after he sent his telegram, orders were issued for an action to be carried out in Denmark. Twice, on August uh, 31st and again on September 17, the offices of the Jewish community were raided and searched. Danish and German Nazis removed membership lists and registers, which caused unrest, unrest within the community. And rumors began about an impending action. And at this point, um, around uh, 60 Jews already fled to Sweden. That is like, in September um, 43. On September 28, um, leading social democrats were contacted by Geo Ferdinand Dukwitz, a German shipping attaché at the German legation in Denmark, who informed that an action would take place on the night, on the night of October 1st. On the evening of September 28, the chairman of the Jewish community C.B. Uh, Henriquez was approached by the politicians who told him about the warning they had received. Henriquez, who had shortly before been reassured by the Danish foreign ministry that there was no danger, was difficult to convince about the opposite. Today, it is still debated whether Dukwitz leaked the information with Werner Best's knowledge or on his own account. 
after <clears throat> the chief rabbi had been arrested or taken hostage on August 29, the main synagogue in Copenhagen had been closed. But as the Jewish New Year approached, Rabbi Markus Melcher reopened it. Um, he therefore led the early, the early morning Selichot service on September 29, interrupting it with the warning that arrest would take place a few days later. So this was like a special, very early uh, service um, for, um, for the Jewish New Year. Despite the limited number of people who are present in the synagogue, uh, the warning reached the vast majority of Jews in Denmark in a short time. Many people immediately went into hiding with friends, acquaintances or strangers, or went to the summer cottages while awaiting passage to Sweden. Others headed for the northern coast to make contact, and that's like the northern coast of uh, Zealand, so uh, north of Copenhagen, um, <clears throat> uh, to make contact with fishermen there and make arrangements to be ferried across the Sound to Sweden. Many children were hidden with non-Jewish families or in orphanages. Some of them later followed their parents to Sweden, others remained in hiding until the liberation. The warning also reached uh, the Jews on Funen and on the peninsula. The largest group of Jews there were these young refugees who had come to Denmark to learn agriculture. Um, in many cases, the warning didn't reach them and 71 of them were arrested, most, on the, most of them on the farms where they lived, uh, a few during attempted escape. From the last days of September and during the first three weeks of October, more than 7,000 people fled because they or their family members were designated as Jews or half Jews under Nazi racial laws. If you were half Jew or if you were married to an Aryan, you were in fact exempted from deportation from Denmark, but a few were deported despite this. And many half Jews did not trust that they would be exempt in the long run and chose to flee anyway. To begin with, help for the, refuge help for the refugees was not organized. Most relief groups did not form until a week into October. Until then, for the most part, the escapees themselves found willing fishermen to ferry them across, or they bought rowboats and uh, rowed themselves uh, over the sand. When the relief groups were established, they collected large sums of money to finance the escape. This covered the cost of people who did not have the means to pay for their own crossing, the aid groups also provided shelters, liaised with doctors who could sedate young children so they would not expose the refugees by crying, and they negotiated with skippers to organize crossings in, on bigger boats. For the vast majority, the escape ended happily, but being on the run was dramatic enough in itself. Some had to try several times before the crossing was successful, some refugee helpers and fishermen cheated and took money without making sure that people got across. There were many different routes uh, to Sweden from both northern and southern Zealand. Some of the best known disembarkation points being Gilelai, Snegerstein, Drauer and the ports of Copenhagen. That's what I wanted to show you. Well, um, to give an idea of how such a flight took place, I will in short tell the story of one girl Hannah Posner, who was 11 years old in 1943. She was born in Darmstadt, Germany in March 32. In November 39, her mother had brought her and her two brothers to Denmark after their father had arrived to Copenhagen earlier that year, um, following his release from the Buchenwald concentration camp, where he had been imprisoned after the Kristallnacht. The family intended to continue to the US, but when Denmark was occupied, that failed. Even though Hannah had just begun second grade in Germany, after her arrival to Denmark, she was moved a year down to first grade because she did not know Danish. Her father was not allowed to work because he was a refugee and therefore had not obtained a work permit. 
The family was, however, lucky since they managed to get some of their funds transferred from Germany, something which was not possible for all Jewish refugees. One of the last days in September 43, Hannah's mother told her that she should empty her school bag, pack some clothes and go to see her friend Tove, who lived on the same street. She had to stay there for some days, but was not told why. Tove's parents were afraid that other people would discover they were hiding Hannah, and she was therefore not even allowed to look out the window. After a few days, Hannah was picked up by a woman she didn't know, and she was brought to another place where she reunited with her younger brother. After staying, uh, with a, uh, <clears throat> after staying about a week with the family, uh, Hannah and her brother were brought to the shore where their mother and older brother awaited them. They hid in the hold of a fishing vessel and sailed during night. On October 13, they arrived in Hugenes, Sweden, where they were reunited with Hannah's dad, who had crossed the Sound 10 days earlier. A number of families did like uh, the Posner families and split up before they attempted fleeing. Many had heard how in Norway and in Germany, men and older boys were arrested first. So in a number of cases, people tried to let their fathers and older sons leave first. And here I have a picture of uh, Hannah uh, at 11 years old that is taken uh, upon her arrival in Sweden and the document uh, where she is registered in Sweden. You know yeah. what? It may be that Molly can share this photo from her screen. You want to? Oh yeah, can you do it? that? Let's see if we because can I send that. it to you. So if you can show that now, great. We'll give it a try. Great. Um. So, yeah, it's that one. Uh, upon arrival in Sweden. All refugees were registered by the Swedish authorities and then either housed in refugee camps or if they had relatives living in Sweden, they were allowed to go to them. In the beginning of their Swedish stay, Hannah and her siblings were placed with different foster families while their parents were looking for jobs and accommodation. Finally, after two months, Hannah and her younger brother were reunited with their parents. The older brother remained with a foster family in Stockholm, where he had begun high school. Hannah went to the local school in Södertälje, a small town outside Stockholm, which she was very happy for. The family remained in Sweden for 18 months. Shortly after the liberation in May 45, the Posners returned to Copenhagen. The oldest brother, however, remained in Stockholm to finish high school. This entailed some unexpected consequences for the family. While not returning with the organized repatriation, he was afterwards not allowed any longer to return to Denmark. Having been stateless while fleeing in 43 and having been in Denmark only from 39, he was neither considered Danish nor as a resident in Denmark. So he had to remain in Sweden. It was thus a hard return to Denmark for the now split family. Also for Hannah, who had learned Swedish, which is relatively close to Danish, and who then had to relearn Danish. Um, she started in the local school and had good marks in everything except for Danish language. And therefore she was again moved down a class. So now she was two years younger, no, older, sorry, than her classmates. This was in very brief Hannah's story. Today she is active telling it to school children all over Denmark. Most refugees managed to get to Sweden relatively easy, but there were a number of difficult crossings and also regular tragedies. At least 10 people committed suicide out of fear of deportation, and one of the most tragic fates in this regard was the Salmonsen family, where father and husband took the lives of his two small daughters and his wife on the shore while awaiting a boat that he thought would not show up. He then tried to commit suicide, but failed. And if you can now show the next picture, um, some crossings could be very dramatic. Here you see four siblings who managed to row over the sound, even though uh, an ear broke during the, the trip. And that's the, the ear he, uh, he is, um, uh, or sorry, not ear. Um, uh, 
yeah, you can see the ore, the broken ore there. Um, some crossings could be very dramatic. Um, no, sorry, that's what I just said. Uh, but not all of those who set out on the sea made it safely to Sweden. A few boats wrecked and at least 23 refugees and a helper drowned trying to cross the sound in the cold October night. Uh, I will now read a part of a real-time description made in, in 43 of what happened when a fishing boat was hit by a Swedish vessel to which the refugees were to be transferred and taken ashore. It, it is a description made by a 36-year-old woman, Anna Vallo, who was on board with her husband, David, and their three children. After describing how the Swedish vessel sailed directly into the fishing boat, she continues. I had a rope between my hands. Now I saw a whole lot of ropes hanging down along the ship and human being clinging to each rope. I heard David yell, rescue my wife, rescue my children. I tried to yell to David that I was right there and that I was able to stand up in the water and that the children could swim, but he should save himself because he had never been able to swim. But my teeth were chattering in my mouth and not much sound was coming from me. Guda, where was Guda? I started screaming. Guda, where are you? But mother, I'm right here, Guda said, chattering her teeth. I didn't realize that I had been holding her uh, holding around her neck with one arm. Now it was Guda's turn to pu be pulled up. She worked her way from one rope to another until she reached the hatch. Where's my wife? Where are my children? Save my wife, save my children. David had almost no strength to shout anymore. Two strong sailors lay alongside the ship while others held him. They grabbed hold of each of my arms and pulled me aboard. I remained lying on the deck. The children began to shake and tear me and lifted me up. David, where was he now? Now I saw the sailors lifting him up the same way they had lifted me. He was lying lifeless on deck. I thought he was dead. I began crying and shouting at him. A moment later, he got up. Have you really all been saved? He began to hug and kiss us. Now I began to shiver with cold. And then she describes, uh, she continues describing what's going on on deck, but I jump a bit. Uh, their family is now brought inside the boat's cabin. It was a big cabin for eight, and now we could start looking around. It was full of rescued people. Suddenly I realized that not everything was as, as it should be. The young German woman was crying. She had lost her child in the water. We didn't realize the scale of the accident. Little by little, we learned how many people had drowned that night. The serious and saddened man had been standing with his two children when the accident happened. He was a skilled swimmer, but could only save one of the children. And the 10-year-old boy, who was also a skilled swimmer, the mother had tried in vain, in vain to wake him, but the sleeping pill had been too strong. I couldn't bear to look at them. The German doctor and his wife had not been saved either. Now their young son was all alone in this new and strange land. He was crying and very distressed. David had been standing next to the nurse's brother. He had been happy. He had just graduated as an accountant and thought there was a good future ahead of him in Sweden. He was an athletic young man. David thought he had been hit by, hit by the ship when it hit us. He lost his life along with his mother." Unquote. In this particular accident, which took place on October 9th, seven people drowned, among them three children, the youngest of whom was only two months old. David Vallo had paid 7,500 Danish crowns for, crossing, for the crossing of him and his family. That equals in today's value about 27,425 US dollars. They paid 1,500 Danish crowns per person, which was the average price, price for a crossing at that time. This boat carried 26 people. It is important to underline that we do not know about anybody who was left behind if they could not pay. This was, however, not because the fishermen lowered their prices, but because other refugees then paid more. And after the networks of helpers became active around October 8, uh, the fishermen were paid directly by the networks who negotiated the prices and often insisted on crossings on bigger boats for larger groups at a time. It is clear from testimonies and Swedish documentation 
that the vast majority of refugees paid something. And to understand how high these prices were, you should know that a skilled worker would earn about 400 Danish crowns a month. So the average amount in early October was close to four months of salary for workers and some paid sums which were much higher. The fare for crossing the Sound illegally before October 1st it was about 850 Danish crowns. With the Judenaktion, it increased drastically to about 2,000 Danish crown per person. Then after the relief committees were formed, it dropped to about 1,300 to 1,500 per person. And finally, by the second half of October, it went down to about 500 Danish crowns per person. Was it dangerous to help the Jews flee? On September 5, 1943, a statement had been issued by the commander of German troops in Denmark regarding capital punishment for helping saboteurs. Yet a similar statement was never made regarding help provided to the Jews. Some refugee helpers did distinguish between whether it was Jews or saboteurs they should shelter or sail with in October 43. Thus, there are some accounts from organized helpers who were either part of the resistance or had strong ties to it, who tell about how it could be difficult to make fishermen sail with saboteurs in October 43, as this was considered dangerous, contrary, contrary to helping the Jews. There were next to no arrests made for helping the Jews. The exception was a few fishermen arrested when they came back into the harbor, but they were soon after handed over to Danish police and their sentences were symbolical. Helpers who were later deported were not deported in relation to their actions towards the Jews, but for involvement afterwards with the resistance. The risk was indeed small and at least some people were aware of that at the time. Whereas it for long was considered that the exorbitant prices to cross the Sound were a fair insurance for sailing Jews to Sweden, historians have now showed that this insurance by far surpassed the value of the boats. It has even been concluded that the high prices were an important factor for many of the fishermen to act. Um, how are we on time after these cuttings? Well, I will talk a bit about the arrests as well since it is often believed that all the Jews of Denmark managed to flee to Sweden. However, on Friday, October 1st, 1943, the telephones were disconnected and groups of German police soldiers assisted by Danish SS volunteers searched Jewish addresses in Copenhagen. Most of them were empty as people had already sought shelter elsewhere. But that night, about 200 people were arrested in the Copenhagen area, most of them in their homes, but a number of people also in hiding or uh, during attempted flight. And about 80 other people were caught on Funen and on the peninsula. The following day, uh, on October 2nd, the first Danish transport with Jews left Olbo uh, on the peninsula by train for Theresienstadt. The train consisting of cattle cars stopped in several towns on the peninsula to carry prisoners from Jutland and Funen. All in all, 83 people were deported on this train. That same morning, a steamer with 198 Jews sailed from the port of Copenhagen to Swinemünde, uh, now uh, uh, today's Swinusche from where the journey was made by cattle cars to Theresienstadt. Whereas there was only one night of house raids, a number of arrests took place in several cases based on informants after the night of October 1st. Other people were discovered by random. And in a few cases, shots were fired during the arrests resulting in the death of a woman and a young man. People who were arrested after the raid of October 1st were imprisoned in Camp Horserud, a prison camp in Northern Zealand uh, from <clears throat> uh, next to Elsinore. And from here, another two transports left on October 13th and November 23rd. And I think I have a, a slide showing an overview of these yeah, four transports. Um, so all in all, 
all 472 people were deported as a result of the Judenaktion. Already during the night of the raid, there were strong protests against the arrests. King Christian X was one of the first to send a letter of protest to Bernabest, followed by the universities and business organizations, among others. And on Sunday, October 3rd, clergymen across the country protested by reading a pastoral letter during church service in support of the Jews. The Ministry of Foreign Affairs followed the fate of the deportees as closely as possible. Thus, in January 44, they managed to get five people returned who had been deported by mistake, so to say, meaning that they should have been exempted according to the rules applied by the Germans in Denmark, as they were either married to a non-Jew or had a non-Jewish parent and were baptized and not member of the Jewish community. Everyday life in Ghetto Theresienstadt was marked by hunger, hard work, and overcrowding. Added to this was the fear of, a tra of transports eastward and the uncertainty of what the future would bring. Men and women lived separa separately in large lice and flea infested dormitories. And it was not until the summer 44 that some of the Danish families were allowed to live together in families. In March 44, after more than six months of captivity, the prisoners from Denmark began to receive parcels of food and vitamins, even though no official permission had yet been granted to ship these. This was coordinated by a private group of people in strong cooperation with the Ministry of Social Affairs. By the end of summer 44, Danes were officially allowed to receive parcels and the Danish Red Cross took over these shipments. The vast majority of the cost of the parcels were paid for by the Ministry of Social Affairs. The parcels were sent to all deportees from Denmark, whether Danish or stateless. The parcels eased the situation of the prisoners who went from subsisting mainly on thin soup and bread to receive parcels containing, among other things, oatmeal, butter, sugar, chip, uh, crisp bread, uh, powdered milk, and cheese. Statistically, fewer Danish prisoners died after the food packages began to arrive. Uh, they provided vital nutritional supplement and thanks to that and to the fact that the Danes as a group were exempted uh, the transports to Auschwitz-Birkenau, 89% of the Danish group survived. So all in all, out of the 470 deportees, a total of 53 adults died, one of them, one of them uh, had been included in a transport to Auschwitz and one man was sent, that's from the last transport, was sent from Majdanek, uh, no, no, to Majdanek from Sachsenhausen. Furthermore, two babies who were born in the ghetto by women from Denmark died there after a few weeks of life. Theresienstadt was a transit camp from which more than 88,000 people were taken to the extermination camps of Auschwitz, Birkenau, Treblinka, and other sites of mass killings. During the ghetto's existence, some 140,000 prisoners arrived uh, to Theresienstadt, where about 34,000 perished. The exemption of the Danish prisoners applied to all the deportees from Denmark, regardless of whether they were Danish citizens or not. The reason for the exemption of the Danish group is not known, but it might be connected with Nazi propaganda efforts. On April 13, 1945, the deportees from Denmark uh, were told to pack their belongings, they were to be released. They were picked up by a caravan of white painted buses with Swedish flags. 423 people, all in all, were led on board uh, these buses that left on April 15. The people were the deportees from Denmark, uh, together with a few women who had married into the group, some of them shortly before the buses arrived, children born in the ghetto by Danish women, as well as a Danish uh, boy who had grown up in Germany. And if you can show the next slide. Um, a young man was imprisoned in a nearby prison for smuggling, and he was not released. He was liberated a few weeks later by the Soviet troops on May 8 and returned to Denmark by the end of May 45. 
The caravan of white buses drove through bumped out Germany to Denmark, where they arrived at the Danish border on April 17. In a temporary quarantine station, the survivors could shower with real soap and were given oatmeal and milk, something many would later remember. After a stop on Funen, they, the journey continued the next morning to Copenhagen from where they were sailed to Sweden and accommodated in quarantine camps. This is where they heard uh, on the radio on May 4 that the German troops in Denmark had surrendered. The former deportees were among the first Jews to return to Denmark as a ship with liberated prisoners, Jews and non-Jews alike, arrived in Copenhagen on May 16th. Two weeks later, the organized repatriation of the exiled Danes began. Upon return, the majority found their homes and belongings again, but many had to be temporarily housed because apartments had been rented out, others had lost everything. There was no systematic looting in Denmark. On the contrary, the social services and office under the municipalities, in many cases, packed, stored and safeguarded Jewish property. In Copenhagen, the social service kept 97 apartments and stored the content of 350 entire homes. The fact that some people lost everything or a lot was due to private arrangements where neighbors or guardians had removed content from the apartments before the social service had packed them up. And so if I still have like two minutes, I will just talk very briefly about the King and the star, which you probably uh, all have heard about. Uh, these stories uh, about the Danish king wearing the Jewish star. Um, this is a myth. Um, no Jews in Denmark, with the exception of the deportees in Theresienstadt, ever wore uh, the badge, and neither, neither did the king. However, uh, the myth didn't just pop up of nothing. Uh, on September 10, 1941, King Christian X held a meeting with his Minister of Finance, Wilhelm Buhl, who was temporarily replacing Prime Minister Stowning, who was ill. Little would the King know that their conversation that they would later become the basis of a persisting myth. The King had just read in the newspapers about how German Jews would have to wear a star. And he noted in his diary an exchange of words he had with the minister about that if Danish Jews were to wear this star, it would be best countered by all, peeping, all people wearing it. Four months later, a satirical drawing was printed in a Swedish newspaper, and you can just uh, show next slide, please, thanks, showing the king discussing with the prime minister and accompan accompanied by an almost identical wording. Um, in 1942, several versions of the myth about the king and the star flourished in Great Britain and the US. They were produced by Danes abroad who actively tried to better Denmark's image, which at this time was tainted because of the cooperation policy which had begun uh, in April 1940. Later at the time, no, later at the time of the Judenaktion, these stories were repeated. And yeah, you can just eventually quickly show the next slide. That's like, you know, okay, that's good. That's the film. If you can just uh, turn it on um, here. It's like a short home movie um, uh, filmed in 41 or 42 by Ralf Oppenheim, a young Jewish man who was later among the deportees. You can see the king riding through Copenhagen on his horse, which he did uh, every morning, actually. Um, there are particularly many people here because it's uh, the students are just out, the white hats, that's like the, um, uh, the students who just had their, how do you say that, when they end high school. Um, so they had their final exam. Uh, the king was very loved by the population and throughout the occupation. He was an important symbol uh, for the Danes. Um, and yeah, there he is on his horse. So that's um, all I wanted to say. So uh, thank you. 
Thank you so much. That was wonderful. I thank think you you, uh, you answered a lot of or addressed a lot of questions that people have had about the experience of uh, Jews in Denmark. Molly, I'll turn it over to you. Yeah, so we'll see what questions people have. Um, so could you um, repeat who organized the caravan of white buses? Yeah, it's, um, I think I, I might not have said that actually. It's uh, organized between the Swedish Red Cross and at, actually it's an entire Scandinavian thing. It's the Swedish Red Cross. It's sometimes also called the Bernadotte Action. Uh, beca because the Swedish Red Cross was headed by, by Count uh, Bernadotte. Um, it's the Danish uh, Ministry of Social Affairs. I involved uh, the Danish uh, uh, ad administration. And also, and there are also, um, um, yeah, it's, it's uh, the, the, um, the buses that go to Theresienstadt, because it's not all the same buses, there are Danish buses and there are Swedish buses. And in the last moment, they decide that it's the Swedish buses who are uh, running on gas that should go to Theresienstadt because that's a, a quite a long trip. Um, whereas there are also generator driven buses that are more unstable. Um, and they they take the shorter um, drives um, and uh, yeah th and this it, it takes place at the same time while they are driving from Theresienstadt there are other people there are Scandinavian prisoners uh, being picked up in um, in Neuengamme for example so it's it's like a huge operation that takes place uh, mainly in April uh, but also later, even after the end of the war, it continues uh, and, um, and several thousand uh, prisoners are brought to Sweden like that. Uh, the, the Danes are brought to Sweden and not, they don't stop in Denmark because the war is still going on. Uh, so there's still German soldiers in, uh, in Denmark at the time. Um, that's why they don't just stay there uh, when they arrive. Thank you. Um, so another question, um, how did Danish Jews feel about their Danish identity? To what extent did they, were they Danish or Jewish or both in daily life? I think it depends, but most probably felt very Danish. Uh, and uh, yeah, Danish and Jewish. Uh, but, but I think many, yeah, ma many people would, would feel uh, as Danes also. And that's a reason for a number of people uh, not trying to flee actually, uh, especially some of the older people who did not, uh, who are arrested. It's because they feel they are Danes um, and they are old, so this is probably not aimed at them. It's probably aimed at foreign Jews, uh, uh, younger men who could uh, resist or something. So there is this uh, one of the deportees. It's a judge uh, from from a small uh, town um, uh, in the provinces, and he is not trying to flee because he says, uh, "I'm a Danish judge uh, of the Danish." Uh, uh, legal system and uh, my family has lived here for for hundreds of years and of course this is not uh, why would anybody arrest me I'm a judge uh, and I'm a Dane so uh, he didn't uh, and he did he he is actually the last one who died died in Theresienstadt a week before the the buses arrived so that's a very sad story um, thank you um, did uh, any of the boats get stopped by the German Navy during the crossing? No. There is this very strong theme in, mostly in, in uh, fiction, uh, that they are, they are um, uh, how do you say, haunted almost uh, 
uh, on the sea, but the, they didn't get stopped. There's one uh, arrest that took place on sea, but that's because that's that's not because they are stopped at sea. It's a boat, uh, a rowing boat that is picked up by a by a steamer, and the captain calls the pilot boat uh, because he has not yet heard about uh, Jews getting arrested. And he wants them to uh, go back uh, to Denmark. He doesn't want to sail them to Sweden because that's not at all. He's going the opposite way. And then when the pilot boat is about to set off, there is a, um, a German um, uh, coast uh, guard, or he is more than a coast guard. He, he is part of, of uh, SS. Um, and, and he decides to go on board and see what is going on. And then there are eight people that are arrested, but that's the only arrest that take place uh, at sea. But people were of course scared. So if they heard sounds at sea, then in their recollections, uh, they will write that there was this uh, German boat uh, after them. But, but actually at the time, most of the, how do you call that in English? the German, uh, the watch boats or the, the guard boats, they were actually not active at all uh, at this time. So it's a, uh, yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's, yeah, different than in, uh, in the, in fiction uh, works where it's very prominent uh, as a uh, Thank image. You. Um, did the Danish government have any choice not to cooperate with the Germans or to what extent did they have the choice not to cooperate? Yeah, that's of course a, a good question. And it's always hard to say uh, if and if not. Uh, uh, and that's how the, the cooperation uh, policy is, is mostly explained is that if they had not done so, then uh, the situation would have been the same as in Norway, which was a very harsh uh, um, uh, situation. Uh, so, yeah, it's uh, in that sense, uh, it's yeah, it, they, everything would have been very different had they not done so, um, of course. So, thank you. Um, how did you become interested in this specific topic? Um, is there, you know, any way that kind of, you know, led you, your career led you to this point? Um, well, always, or like since I was a, a girl, uh, it always interested me. My, my grandparents came to Denmark as refugees. Uh, my grandmother is a political refugee. Yeah, also my grandfather is a political refugee, but he had Jewish background. So in 43, they fled also to, uh, to Sweden. Um, so therefore, of course, I always found this uh, topic interesting. Um, and, uh, but I never imagined that I would, uh, would work on it. But uh, yeah, that sort of happened. Uh, <laughs> uh in some way or another <laughs> um so and, and the reason why i started studying theresian that that was actually because i felt that the story has had never been told from the point of view of the deportees it was always told from the point of view of denmark and it's two very different stories like one for example is a story about uh, shipping food parcels, uh, visiting the ghetto, uh, organizing the white buses. The other one is a, a story uh, about, uh, yeah, first not receiving any food. Um, it, it takes six months before the food starts. It's about fear of being transported. It's it's about a, a constant uh, fear of death and uh, will there be a tomorrow. Uh, so it's two very, very different stories. And I, I, when I became aware of that, I thought I, I have to, to, yeah, go into that because there are so many, 
uh, testimonies that that uh, tell about this and which forms a very different narrative than the one about the Danish state, which is of course a very important story in itself, but it's two uh, two different stories about the same uh, about the same topic. Right, right. Thank you. Um, another question about why it was so expensive for the Danish people to flee, um, and why that price was so high to go to Sweden by the ships. Yeah, it's the fishermen that uh, sets the price. So they just say, I don't sail if you don't give me this and that uh, large amount. So especially in the beginning where people themselves negotiate, that's very, very hard. Uh, and it's, yeah, ex extremely expensive, of course. Uh, so, and then it, it gets better when, uh, when the relief groups uh, start uh, uh, to, uh, to negotiate for bigger groups um, at a time. And, and also they also collect money, so they also pay uh, uh, some of it. Um, but uh, yeah, it's, uh, that, that's of course a different perspective than when it's, when it's often believed that it's out of sheer, uh, um, how do you say, yeah, goodwill and uh, it's, uh, some did, of course. There are also stories about people who didn't have to pay, uh, mm -hmm. but the vast majority did pay, and many paid really very expensive. Uh, so, uh, and and that's of course something people themselves in the situation do not really negotiate because when you when you fear for your life, you you just pay if you have the possibility, you you just pay. So. Mm -hmm. um, Thank you. So we'll take one more question. Um, what are two to three points that teachers should take away from this story of Danish rescue to tell their students? Hmm. Oof. <laughs> Maybe just one point. <laughs> um, I don't, I, yeah, uh, that, that I didn't think about. Uh, I should come up with something uh, clear and clever. Um, but I, I, I think that it's important to, to have like uh, not only this, this uh, um, narrow perspective of uh, the, the good rescue. Of course, it is overall the good rescue uh, and, and but, but people, first of all, were, were active themselves. So it's not like objects being rescued. It's also an active flight uh, uh, with the active commitment, uh, seeking out people, uh, uh, trying to do something, uh, finding connections. Um, and then it's important also that it's it's not so easy as as it is sometimes uh, recounted. People were cheated. People had to wait. They were desperate. They uh, yeah. It, it's um, people uh, families were split up. There are also families where half of the family end up in Theresienstadt, the other half in in um, in Sweden. It's it's not uh, of course compared to the Holocaust in, in other places, if we compare to Poland, this is like such a great story, even with the, with the non-great parts. But if we look at the rescue uh, and flight uh, as such, it's, yeah, it's important to, to also get the nuances. Uh, I think this was a not so clear answer to the question, but. <laughs> No, no, I think it's good. It's that it's complicated and nuanced story. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you so much, Sylvia, um, for your great presentation today. Um, and thank you to everyone for joining us. Uh, our next session will be at 1015. Um, and our next speaker will be Daniel Riff, who is presenting his grandmother's story of survival during the Holocaust in Ukraine. Um, so thank you, everyone. And we hope to see you soon. So thank you. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you, Dr. Frakapan. Bye-bye. Thank bye you. Bye.